It's 11 o'clock, so we should probably get going. Welcome to the next session on the book of Revelation. This one is about the seven bowls, angels dumping out the contents of the bowls which contain plagues. This session is a little bit shorter. Each of the bowls are only a verse or two, so <laughs> we're, we're probably, we may get done early, although I, may, I, I think I will uh, take the opportunity to do a little bit of review to make sure we, we're all caught up. Um, any questions or comments from the material from last time? I do have some old business. I think Gretchen mentioned, she brought up last time, uh, the Grapes of Wrath from chapter 14. Let's go back and take a look at that. I just missed the, the references to that. Plumbing services near me. No, no, we don't want that. Uh, um, the Bible Gateway is free, but they make you look at ads, so let's get rid of the plumbing services here. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Then another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over fire, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Use your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and gathered the vintage of the earth, and he threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for a distance of about 1,600 stadia. That's about 200 miles, roughly 200 miles. A lot of blood. So references to that uh, passage in Revelation, of course, uh, the John Steinbeck not novel, The Grapes of Wrath. Also, Gretchen pointed out the Battle Hymn of the Republic. The words are taken from that uh, revelation. And we have, we have some extra time here, so I'm going to play a video for you. Uh, what what better than the Tabernacle Choir, right? Uh, the sound plays through the projector, so.
Well, that's the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. Uh, they no longer talk to, uh, 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 call themselves the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. They rebranded themselves in 2018 um, on the recommendation of the uh, LDS church uh, officials. They uh, recommended that uh, their affiliated organizations, uh, such as the choir, no longer use the name Mormon to uh, refer to, the, to themselves. So they're the uh, Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square now. So that's the uh, Grapes of Wrath. Thought I'd do a little bit of review just to make sure we're all on the same page because the uh, the uh, seven bowls won't take uh, the whole hour. So let's go back to a few things I talked about in the first ses session. The book of Revelation is apocalyptic, not prophetic. If we try to read it as a book of prophecy, we're going to come up with some very weird ideas about what's going to happen in the future. Oh, Luann, yes. Yes, Luann says she's heard that there are some conservative evangelical pastors that are uh, uh, looking with expectation uh, as to what's happening in Israel and Palestine right now. Let me defer your question because we're, I'm going to talk about what's called Armageddon a little bit later, okay? So let, I'll talk about that specifically a little bit later. Last time we talked about the Beast 666. This time I'm gonna talk about Armageddon and I'll, I'll bring that up when we get there. But yes, that is, speaks to this question about prophetic versus apocalyptic. Uh, Lutherans tend not to read Revelation as a blueprint for the future, as a description of exactly how events are going to unfold uh, at the end of the age. It's a, uh, we, we tend to read it metaphorically. So it's uh, properly interpreted, we believe it's properly interpreted metaphorically, not literally. The primary message of Revelation is one of hope. John was writing to people oppressed by Rome. He was trying to give them some hope. Well, this, it's not going to be this way forever. Just hold on. God will break into history. Rome is going to be brought down, and things are going to be a lot better for you if you, if you stick to the side of God and not throw yourselves in with the Roman Empire. If you, if you throw yourselves in with the Roman Empire, you're going to go down with the Romans, and look how that's going to turn out. But keep... Keep your faith on God's side, and things are going to work out all right for you. Now, by extension, we can read Revelation as any human empire is going to eventually fail, like Rome did. So that's one way we can read Revelation today. Now, in the, in the last session of this class on November 19th, I'd like to have a discussion. Hopefully, we can have a discussion about what are some of the evil empires today? And I don't mean just countries, literally empires. A um, little bit of a spoiler alert. One of the books I'm using as a reference for this class, the authors think that one of the evil empires of today, now this book was written 25 years ago, but still, um, one of the evil empires is global, global capital uh, that uses um, consumerism to entice people in, buying things, accumulating goods. Um, but we can come up with probably any number of other e evil empires that maybe are countries and maybe are, are not, maybe there are other things. I can think of a couple myself, but let's wait until November 19th, uh, the topic of that Last class is reading Revelation today. 
Uh, his message offered us hope to all who are oppressed by human empires, and uh, his point is the kingdom of God will be victorious. So put your hope on God's kingdom, not on human rulers. Um, Putin, Putin isn't God. Joe Biden isn't God. Donald Trump isn't God. God is God. I'm going to show a slide I showed uh, during the first session. Another reason Revelation is so hard to understand is because it goes in cycles. It is circular. It goes around and around and around. This is an illustration from a class, a, a course called Crossways by Harry Wendt. Uh, this is from Unit 60 about the book of Revelation. And uh, you can go through the cycles, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven signs. Today we're going through the seven bowls, and they, it, it goes around in a circle, and it seems to end with a hymn of praise to God. And you say, well, that must be at the end of the, of the book now. And, well, no, it starts again, and it makes another circle around, telling basically the same story, using a different set of symbols. So today we'll see when the bowls are dumped out, there's another set of plagues on the earth, very much like the other plagues that we heard about last time. And um, Dr. Wendt uh, uh, depicts this as a, an upward spiral going around and around, culminating in the new heaven and earth and the new Jerusalem in the last two chapters of the book. Okay, let's get on to seven bowls. Any comments about what I just said? Okay, seven bowls. First, we have to set the scene. The end of chapter uh, 15 sets the scene. <clears throat> After this I looked, and the temple of the tent of witnesses in heaven was opened, and out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues, robed in pure bright linen with gold sashes across their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were ended. The pouring of the seven bowls, the plagues. Now, we've, like I said, we've heard this before in chapters 8 and 9. Very much like the plagues of the Egypt, against the Egyptians in Exodus chapters 7 through 12, you know the story, and I've told it here too. Now let's go through the bowls. This will be fairly quick because they're a verse or two or three sometimes, but pretty short. First bowl, chap uh, verse two. So the first angel went and poured his bowl on the earth and a foul and painful sore came on those who had the brand of the beast and who worshipped its image. A foul and painful sore. Well, no surprise, we can go back to Exodus for an Old Testament reference to this plague. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take handfuls of soot from the kiln and let Moses throw it in the air in the sight of Pharaoh. It shall become dust over the land of Egypt, all over the land of Egypt and shall cause festering boils on humans and animals throughout the whole land of Egypt. So they took soot from the kiln and stood before Pharaoh and Moses threw it in the air and it caused festering boils on humans and animals. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils afflicted the magicians as well as all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. The second bowl, verse 3.
The second angel poured his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing in the sea died. Pay attention to every living thing. Let's go back and look at chapter 8, because we see something very similar back then, but there's a difference. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something, something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea became blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Back then, it was an incomplete destruction, a third. Here we have complete destruction. I'm not quite sure what John's point was, but this is a, a devastating destruction of this, uh, the, this plague on the sea. Back in uh, Exodus, the Nile the river in the, the water in the Nile is turned to blood. I'm not going to read all of this. I've read it before, back when we were in chapter 8. The third bowl, four through, verses 4 through 7. And now, just as back in chapter 8, this next plague is a plague on fresh water. The third angel poured his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, You are just, O Holy One, who are and were, for you have judged these things. Because they shed the blood of saints and prophets, you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, your judgments are just and true. Plague on fresh water. Again, back in chapter 8. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many died from the water because it was made bitter. And of course, I'll just read one verse from Exodus 7. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and of his officials, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile. All the water in the river was turned into blood. I heard the altar respond. We have a talking altar here. This is, this is not the first time we've heard a voice coming from the altar. Let's go back to chapter 9. Then the angel, sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. In the book of Numbers, we had a talking donkey. Here in Revelation, we have a talking altar. The horns of the altar, I think I showed a picture a few, a few Sundays ago about uh, an altar with vertical extensions at the four corners. Those are the horns of the altar. The fourth bowl, verses 8 and 9. The fourth angel poured his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, but they cursed the name of God who had authority over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. The fifth bowl, verses 10 and 11. The fifth angel poured his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. Remember, we had, when we talked about the beast, there was a dragon, 
and the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth, right? The dragon was the devil, the beast of the sea was Rome, it had seven heads, those represented the Roman emperors, and then there was the beast of the earth, sometimes referred to as the false prophet, that was the Roman emperor Nero, I went through the uh, numerology that led to the number of the beast 666, uh, representing the name of Nero Caesar. So this is the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. And of course, we've heard about darkness before, back in chapter 8. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light was darkened, a third of the day was kept from shining, likewise the night. John must have been a big fan of Exodus. That's all I'll have to say. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven so there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness that can be felt. You know, Exodus, or Revelation, you, you know, it's not a book that just sits out there all by itself. It's, it's, a, it's a part of a long biblical tradition that goes clear back through the Old Testament. You know, we can't just disconnect it from the rest of the, the, the biblical tradition. The sixth bowl, verse 12. The sixth angel poured his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up in order to prepare the way for the kings from the east. So I need to say a few words about the Euphrates and the kings. <clears throat> the Euphrates marked the eastern border of the Roman Empire. To the east of the Roman Empire were the Parthians, enemies of Rome. The water was dried up. What does that mean? Again, let's look back at Exodus to see what the drying up of the Euphrates might mean. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove, back, the, drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on high ground, the waters forming a wall for them on the, their right and on their left. So the drying up of the sea and the drying up the, of the Euphrates will let people cross. And in Revelation, it means the enemies of Rome can freely cross and attack the Roman Empire. Now, John does this quite a bit, or at least he's done this before. Supplementary visions are placed in the middle of these plagues. So after the sixth bowl, we have a supplementary vi vision before we get to the seventh bowl. The seventh bowl uh, turns out to be rather anticlimactic, but uh, the supplementary vision is, turns out to be very interesting. And I saw three foul spirits like frogs coming from the mouth of the dragon, from the mouth of the beast, and from the mouth of the false prophet. There are these three characters we met earlier. The dragon, remember the dragon was the one that was waiting for the child to be born so that he could whisk away the child. The dragon was the devil. The child, of course, was the Messiah. Uh, but his plans were thwarted when the child was taken up to heaven and the throne of God. From the mouth of the beast, this is the beast of the sea representing the Roman Empire, and from the mouth, mouth of the false prophet, otherwise known as the beast of the earth, uh, 666, the Roman Emperor Nero. 
So there are frogs, spirits like frogs, coming from the mouths of these things. These are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. And then there's a quote here from earlier in Revelation. This is God speaking. See, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and is clothed, not going about naked and exposed to shame. End of quote there. And the demonic spirits assembled the kings at the place that in Hebrew is called Harmageddon. Now I'll get to your question, Luann. Spirits like frogs. Again, John is taking verses from Exodus. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go so that they may serve me. If you, refer, if you refuse to let them go, I will plague your whole country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs. They shall come up into your palace, into your bedchamber and your bed, into the houses of your officials and of your people and into your ovens and your kneading bowls. The frogs shall come on you and on your people and on all your officials. And these spirits go to the kings of the world to assemble them for battle. On the great day of God the Almighty, coming like a thief. This is a quote taken from earlier in Revelation. Remember then what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Assembled at Armageddon. I'm using the alternative spelling without an H. This is probably the more common spelling of Armageddon. You may be surprised that this is a real place. Uh, it comes from the Hebrew Harmagedo. Let me show you a map. There it is. To the uh, northwest of the West Bank, not too far from Nazareth. <clears throat> Today, this is a tell, a, a mound, archaeological work has been done and is being done there. This, uh, in older times, this was uh, on several trade routes. And because of the trade routes that passed through this place, it was the site of many battles. Nations fought for control over these trade routes. And this was a famous battle place. Probably why John used it. I mean, if you were writing a piece of science fiction, or in those days it was called apocalyptic literature, and you wanted a, a place for a massive battle at the end of, end of time with all of the nations involved, this famous place of battle, Megiddo, would probably be a pretty good choice. Everybody would know what that meant. Uh, so, uh, this is an actual real place, uh, and it's mentioned several times in the Old Testament. From Judges, the kings came, they fought, then fought the kings of Canaan at Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They got no spoils of silver. How about 2 Kings? Uh, when King Ahaziah of Judah saw this, he fled in the direction of Beth Hagen. Jehu pursued him, saying, Shoot him also. And they shot him in the chariot at the ascent to Gur, which is by Ibleam. Then he fled to Megiddo and died there. Second Chronicles, but Josiah would not turn away from him, but disguised himself in order to fight with him. He did not listen to the words of Necho from the mouth of God, but joined battle in the plain of Megiddo.
Not surprising that uh, John would use such a place as the scene of, a, of, of an epic battle where all of the kings of the earth would meet and, and join in battle at the end of time. Now, to answer Luann's question then, those conservative evangelicals who read Revelation literally um, have decided that there literally will be a battle of the superpowers that will usher in the end of time, the last day, by means of an epic battle at Armageddon, Har Megiddo, there in Israel. So these people are watching with expectation what is happening in Israel and Palestine right now. What if this is the event that will draw the superpowers of the world to battle World War III right there? And yes, in our time, right? Given what else is going on, like in Ukraine and elsewhere, you know, their thinking is maybe, maybe this is the tipping point. I mean, it's a tragic thought. It, it's a tragic thought, but like Luann said, there are people there, out there, who are looking at this with expectation. Uh, yes, Jim. Let, 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 me, let, me, let me give you the mic. Uh, some of us go back far enough in our younger years to Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth. Um, and there have been intermediate figures who do the same thing, prophecy, apocalyptic, and see the correlations to contemporary events. One of the really tragic things is that there are some people who buy that whole frame of reference but they're also inclined in their own actions to want to prompt and encourage <clears throat> uh, this to take place through their actions and violent actions in particular to bring about what they expect uh, because of the literalistic interpretation of apocalyptic and other prophecies. Yeah, um, in that um, in that line of thinking, I'll <clears throat> have to give a dishonorable mention to um, Pre President Trump's uh, m m moving the um, U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, uh, which was a, a you know a, a, an, an act that probably in, encourage that sort of thinking among those people. Okay, have we exhausted the subject of Armageddon or, or are there other comments? Thank you, Luann, for bringing that up. All right, the seventh bowl. Compared to Armageddon, this is probably anticlimactic. Or maybe not. There's a big earthquake here. The seventh angel poured his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. And there came flashes of lightning, rum rumblings, peals of thunder, and a violent earthquake such as had not occurred since people were on the earth. So violent was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts and the cities of nations fell. God remembered great Babylon and gave her the wine cup of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away and no mountains were to be found. And huge hailstones, each weighing about a hundred pounds, dropped from heaven on people 
until they cursed God for the plague of the hail. So fearful was that plague. The great city, of course, is Rome. Great Babylon also refers to Rome. Remember, that's a metaphorical reference. As Rome oppressed the people, uh, so did Babylon centuries earlier. Remember what we read in chapter 14. Then another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her prostitution. According to Hale, we've um, read about uh, a plague of Hale earlier in chapter 8. We can also look at earlier re references to Hale and uh, Exodus and also in the apocryphal book, The Wisdom of Solomon. The Lord said, this is Exodus, the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven so that hail may fall on the whole land of Egypt, on humans and animals and all the plants of the field in the land of Egypt. Then Moses stretched out his staff toward heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire came down on the earth and the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt there was hail with fire flashing continually in the midst of it, such heavy hail as had never fallen in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the open field throughout all the land of Egypt, both human and animal. The hail also struck down all the plants of the field and shattered every tree in the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were, was there no hail. Oh, I forgot to read Wisdom. Go back. And hailstones full of wrath will be hur hurled as from a catapult. The water of the sea will rage against them and the rivers will re relentlessly overwhelm them. Now, there's no hymn to God at the end of this cycle. For the last, I think the last three cycles, we ended with a hymn of praise to God which made us think the book was over, but of course it wasn't. But there is no hymn at the end of this cycle, nor will there be at the next uh, cycle. Um, now, note, we don't have class next week. There is a congregational meeting. So please show up for that. We need a quorum. Uh, in two weeks, we'll talk about the seven sites. That'll be a little bit longer lesson. So we're going to finish early today. Any comments about uh, Larry? Uh, question. How was Revelation situated within the sixteen years of the Tribulation? Because I don't remember that being mentioned. How was Revelation circulated? I don't know specifically about Revelation, but typically New Testament letters were circular letters that were typically what happened was when a church received a letter somebody who could read or write made a copy of it and then s sent the letter by courier to the next to the next church uh, so uh, new testament scholars uh, usually have more than one copy to work with but of course humans make mistakes when they're copying which is one of the problems of New Testament scholarship, you've got these copies, and well, I wonder which one is right. <laughs> and, and when did the Revelation become part of the canon? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the, um, that's a good question. I'd have to look that up. And then another one, what should readers think of Revelation? <laughs> <laughs> I can guess that Luther probably didn't think much of Revelation. Oh, did, did, All the references to the Old Testament. Yeah, you'd have to be somewhat educated in the Old Testament. Well, you'd have to be a lot educated in, in, the, in, the, in the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, yeah, right. So, yeah, I can imagine that uh, the Revelation would not, have not have been a very popular book among the uneducated. True. 
Okay, anything else? All right, thanks for coming. We'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>